So let's, I'm just going to tell you a wee bit about what CHECS is all about and about the National Conference. CHECS stands for Community Health Exchange and CHECS supports community-led approaches to improve health and well-being and tackle health inequalities. CHECS has been funded by Public Health Scotland and previously by NHS Scotland for the past 22 years. Over the years, CHECS has built a strong reputation as a trusted voice for the community, for its expertise, information, and continues to be viewed as a credible source of information through different sectors at different levels of practice and policy in Scotland. CHECS annual conference is a chance to come together to explore the key issues from community health led in Scotland. The key word there is exchange, so all your views, we want to hear them today. This year, we want to place a spotlight on how community-led health organisations and those tackling health inequalities are working on the front line of the cost of living crisis. With communities and groups coming under intense pressure and still recovering from the impact from the pandemic, this conference is a chance to share stories, of the organisations doing vital work under very difficult circumstances and conditions. And a place for you all to share your insights, your ideas, and your own lived experience. Today, we want to give you the opportunity to share with one another how you're supporting communities, the pressures your organisations are facing, and the increasing demands being put on your staff your volunteers, and I would say yourselves. We'll also be exploring what message we want to send to the decision makers. We, what we think they need to do, I'll start that again, because this is important. What we think they need to do is support people in our organisations and make the wider changes we need urgently. So we look forward to seeing your messages from your workshops up on the wall later, and we want to hear your voice loud and clear throughout the day. Okay, thank you. So who am I? I'm Brenda Black, I'm the Chief Executive of Edinburgh Community Food. This is a wee bit about Edinburgh Community Food on the wall here, um, our, um, about our values and what our strategic aims are. There's quite a few people in the room that I recognise that I've worked with and partnered with over the years. So, Hello and welcome to everybody, and thanks for your support. I'm also um, on the board of the Community Health Forum in Edinburgh, and I can see Daniel up the back there. Hello, Daniel, welcome over. Um, and I'm also one of the founding directors of Glasgow Community Food Network. I'm a state registered dietitian, and I sit in quite a few of the Scottish governments and the City of Edinburgh Councils and some UK wide advisory groups. Um, on how to develop new equitable food systems. Specific experience that I have um, is around vulnerable groups. I worked in the homelessness sector in Glasgow, uh, people affected by addictions, poverty and inequality. But before my time in terms of working in the charitable sector, I worked in the commercial sector for 25 years. And those skills that I honed in the commercial sector have set me up in good stead for everything that I've faced in this sector. Um, what I was always surprised about is how willing people are to share their knowledge and their time, whereas in the commercial sector, that's just something that doesn't happen. So I thank for pe people for doing that. So we, Edinburgh Community Foods, we're based in Leith, in the heart of Leith, in two, as I said before, two very, very cold warehouses. And I'm sure that Theodora will attest to that. We use food to tackle health inequalities by providing access, availability, affordability, adequate, which means nutritious food, and engagement to nourish people. We do this through expertise in supply chains, education, food discovery, skill sharing, coaching, partnership, working through all things food. We have developed our practice to do things like HIC, which you'll hear more about today, Henry, which is behavioural change. So we, as we do all these different things around food, we constantly look at other models and methods to adapt and support 
people in our community. We're a social enterprise. Uh, we have a social enterprise team and we have a community development team of nutritionists and community development workers. And Theodora is here today. Hi, Theodora. And she'll be doing a presentation on HIC. And we work with about 150 partners citywide. Last year, we did 28 projects. Before COVID, we did eight projects a year. Um, and that's with the same size of team. So you can see how weary we, we, we both are. And I'll, I'll talk about that a wee bit in, as we go on. As I said, we've got expertise in terms of supply chains, logistics, know-how, experience. But like all community organisations and all community-led organisations, we're nimble, we're flexible, we're reactive, we're willing, we're tired, um, we're underfunded, um, but you know we step up. So the sort of things that we've been working on in the last year, Ukraine response, hospital discharge, doing work in terms of oral health for the Scottish Government, which will be spread and scaled in Scotland. And we work with UK-wide partners like Veg Power, Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign, and Sustain on a Hospital Discharge um, ask. So in terms of um, how COVID affected us, we probably did, you know, in a normal week, maybe about 50 boxes. During the, the COVID pandemic, we went up to 1,200 boxes of fresh food from our local supply chain. How has the cost of living affected our service? Well, last October, I was able to tell the Scottish Government that our donations had went down 60% from the public. Our private donations and our funders had went down 50%. The food costs had went up between 12.5% and 17.5%. And we were still delivering the same amount of work and projects. So somebody needs to take, you know, the, the ramifications of that and a lot of the times it was my staff and you know and I think we're going to hear a lot about the working environment today. We need food to live and it's the thing that gets squeezed the most and we're £35 short on a person's income to be able to meet the government's guidelines on nutritional food requirements in a week. The, we support the cash first approach Budgeting is not an issue for the people that we support. The people that we support can budget well and they can tell us a thing or two. So budgeting is not the issue. Not having enough money is the issue. People need energy to cook. So we are supplying money for energy. It's no point of talking to people about things if we don't think things through. We provide energy and money for cooking. We provide equipment that is low energy cooking, like slow cookers, air fryers, freezers, ready-made meals. Lots of things, skill sharing, non-judgmental, total exception. But what we do is action on not just the delivery of food, but everything that goes around food. And I'm sure that everybody in the, the room is well aware of that. Now, hopefully that gives you a wee bit of insight in terms of myself, the organisation and the things that we are doing that are the gaps in terms of provision around food and what people need. What we have today is we have Chick Collins, which we're really lucky to have um, as our keynote speaker. Chick Collins is the director of Glasgow Centre of Public Health, uh, Population and Health, sorry about that, taking up the position in January 2023, so very new, welcome. Previously, Chick was the director of the University of the Faroe Islands, and that's where his good lady wife comes from, who speaks five languages, we've learned that this morning. And prior to that, he was the Professor of Allied Social Science and a Senior Academic and Leader Manager at the University of West of Scotland. Chick has published a wide range of topics, including language and social exchange, community development and urban policy. Between 2010 and 2017, he worked for the Glasgow Centre of Population and Health and others on a collaborative project focusing on the accounting for the problematic excess of mortality in Scotland and in particular Glasgow which is you know the the Glasgow effect is something that brings anger to me but action all in the one sentence during this time at the University of West of Scotland Czech has co-founded and co-led the um, University of West of Scotland Oxford 
Oxfam partnership for a more equitable and sustainable Scotland. Chex and SCDC have worked with the Glasgow Centre of Population and Health for a number of different projects over the years. And just sitting at the table this morning, there's already another project on the table. There was a couple of conversations. I could just see another piece of work coming out of it. And we're delighted that Chick is here to share his expertise and commitment to tackling health inequalities. We need people like Chick and we need them to talk to us and tell, them, tell us about the academic side of it. Today, Chick will be speaking to us about the unequal impact of the cost of living crisis and what insights Glasgow Centre for Population and Health work offers in responding to the crisis in the short and long term. To support those most affected and address the underlying inequalities. Without further ado, I'm just going to welcome Chick up and it's over to you, Chick. Thank you. Well, after a, can you hear me? Am I switched on? Aye. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is for the people online. Okay. And this is for you guys. Okay. I'm catching up here. Well, after a, an introduction like that, I guess I can only go downhill. So I'll try not to go downhill too quickly or too dramatically. So yeah. Um, just check if this is going to work. It is. So actually. I'm standing in today for my colleague, Pete Seaman. Uh, some of you might know Pete. Um, he's been taken ill recently, uh, been in hospital for a few days, back out. Those of you who know him, he's, he's doing okay, um, but he's likely to be off work um, for a wee while. Uh, and it will be a wee bit of a guddle today for me because I'm working with aspects of the presentation that Pete had prepared for you. And then I've tried to kind of, you know, take some things out and put my own stuff in. Um, and this is the title that uh, Pete um, had adopted, and I've kept that title because I think it's a good title and the right title. The Cost of Living Crisis, the latest stage in a continuing crisis of health and health inequalities. And I'll give you a wee bit of poetry at the start. Um, uh, Brenda just said I'm back from the Faroe Islands, so you have to forgive me. I'm enjoying being able to speak ordinary Scottish and not having to speak proper English all the time to everyone so that everyone can understand me. So bear with me if I kind of slip into vernacular Scots. I grew up in Kilmarnock and uh, the place that became known as the Scheme, and it's nice to be go able to go back to a kind of Scottish way of speaking from time to time. So I'm giving you a wee bit of poetry at the start. This is from Thomas Hardy. If way to the better there be, it exacts a full look at the worst. Exacts there means requires or demands or needs. So it's a way of saying if we're going to have an impact on a difficult situation, we need to confront the reality of that situation rather than dress it up and present it as something which is maybe a bit less challenging than it really is. So I don't do that today in order to be gratuitous, in order to demoralise people or give people a sense that all is lost. Quite the reverse. Because I do it because we need to, by confronting things as they actually are, we have the possibility of maybe being effective. But if we don't do that, then we're going to struggle. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I've got notes here, but now I can't even remember where I'm at. So I'll try and pick up. So um, GCPH were very aware of the work of checks, the many community organizations which are part of its network. And the work of many others, uh, some of you here today who are at the sharp end or at the deep end, to use that phrase of community health, and who from there are seeking to influence policies and practices in relation to the determinants of health. Now, we're aware of that from a myriad of sources, including GTPH's own work with community organisations. I see Mohassan, one of my colleagues up at the back there. Give us a wave, Mohassan, so that everyone can see you, who... Um, <laughs> is leading on some of our community engagement work, and I'm delighted to see Mohassan here today. Um, in previous lives, some of those lives that Brenda was referring to there, I have myself worked with community organisations. I first met Susan, we just discovered this morning when I was doing some work in Cuffleton and Lillybank in 1994. 
Yeah, how can that be true? Yeah. <laughs> uh, also worked with organisations in Clyde Bank and Fergusley Park and other places. So, um, so both GCPH and I have seen how such organisations support people to live well and more healthily, how you empower communities to exercise voice and also how you are often first responders in crisis situations. A very clear example of that during COVID when voluntary and third sector organisations responded very quickly and with agility to address really urgent needs when statutory services, especially in the early stages, were really struggling to cope with the circumstances. And this September 2020 COVID research briefing from Children's Neighbourhood Scotland summed that up. And you can see some of it here. The scale of organisation and coordination of food provision and other forms of practical and emotional support was remarkable. Okay, so we know that from the work that community organisations do. And so for that reason, we wanted, and amongst you know, other reasons too, we wanted to honour Pete's commitment to be here. I'm lucky to be the one who gets to pick up the responsibility. As uh, Brenda said, I'm a new director at GCPH, just 10 weeks in the job, and I need to be out and about and finding what's happening uh, in, in the real world, so to speak, uh, and a lot of learning to do, a lot of organisations to meet and people to meet. It's further helpful because I've just returned from abroad. I was away in the Faroe Islands for a few years where things are very different. Yeah, where litter gets picked up in the street, where roads get repaired, uh, where pavements get repaired, where the basic infrastructure is not falling apart, where you don't feel as if you're living in a bankrupt urban neighbourhood. Yeah. Coming back to Glasgow in particular has felt to me like visiting New York in the early 1980s. It feels like visiting a bankrupt city. Okay, I think that's really important. And you see that, I think, maybe more clearly when you come back from abroad. I'm seeing quite a few nods from people there. Um, but have people caught up with that? And are we confronting the reality of that situation sufficiently? Or on the current trajectory, are we likely to can just continue and too many people to acquiesce in that downward spiral. So it's great that you're meeting in person for the first time in three years this year. The virtual events are good, but there's nothing to beat coming together as actual physical people in an actual room. It was fantastic to speak with uh, Lorna and Anne this morning, just the energy that you get from that straight away. So um, getting together to discuss, to learn from each other, to agree what needs to be said and what needs to be done. So I'm going to be interested to find out where that leads you today. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave before lunch. I've got to be elsewhere just because of my calendar. But I'm hoping I'm going to get a, a good report on the discussions that you've had today and what you've decided and agreed needs to be said and needs to be done. The discussions that you're having and the insights that you've got are badly needed in the current situation. Your focus is on the cost of living crisis. That's the correct spotlight, in my view. Um, I, uh, to look at how community-led health organisations and those tackling health inequalities are working on the front line of the crisis. Because we know that income, lack of income more specifically, poverty and hardship, is the most important single determinant of health. And that a cost of living crisis is by definition, and as night follows day, a health crisis. Now, I imagine, and we've heard it from Brenda already, and I'm sure we'll hear it from many other people today, that this crisis is already heavily shaping your daily activities, that you will be responding to it based on the long-standing and trusted relationships you have developed over years and in some cases decades. I also imagine, and again, you know, I'm sitting there last night writing this furiously and thinking, I hope I'm not missing the point here. And I wrote this, I wrote, I also imagine that some of you will be finding yourself doing it in circumstances where your resourcing is being challenged by cuts of various kinds, that some of you at least are currently being asked to do more with less. So we've had that confirmed already. And all I can say about that is I find that desperately sad, to say the least. So um, I won't spend time going into the detail of the crisis itself because I'm not going to, if I can use that gendered phrase, teach my granny to suck eggs. 
Um, I think it's, you know, it's out there in the world and people see its parameters. It's on the news. It's in the newspapers every day. It's in, I mean, I see something on the BBC last night, you know, a helpline if you're struggling with the cost of living crisis, where you can get help and support. There's a, a widespread public consciousness uh, of it. What's also known, I think, is that the crisis hits hardest those households and communities already made vulnerable by low incomes and bearing the brunt of cuts to services and the unpicking of social welfare safety nets. Now, the Resolution Foundation, this is an organisation, a highly credible organisation, you'll see them on the news quite frequently. Uh, they produced a document in January this year, Living Standards Outlook 2023. The first sentence it said was that 2022 had been, I quote, a disaster for UK living standards, a disaster. These organisations don't use those terms lightly. They use the term a disaster. And then they said later in the same report, 2022 had been a truly horrendous year. You'll know from the stories uh, in the media every day and from your own experience how that translates into the lived experience, to use that phrase, of those who are most exposed. And as the report, the Resolution Foundation report indicates, all of this will have longer term impacts, not just in people's finances, but also on their health. And this they confidently predict based on the difficulties they are already seeing being caused by the crisis for people's mental and physical health. A Public Health Scotland uh, briefing in September of last year identified these groups as the groups who are most exposed to harm. There'll be no surprise there. They are, to a large extent, the same groups who were exposed uh, under COVID. Adults and children living in low-income households, renters, lone parents and single working age adults, unemployed and inactive working age adults, people living in households where someone has a disability and BME households, black and minority ethnic households. But the Resolution Foundation reported further alarmingly that in terms of living standards and therefore by clear implication health and health inequalities, things would get worse before they get better. 2023 is likely to prove to be as bad as 2022. And in the longer term, both child poverty and income inequality will grow. These, the report acknowledges, are truly terrible forecasts. Even if the crisis were to end today, its adverse and unequal impacts will persist. And it will not end today. And it will not end tomorrow. Now, had I been taking up my position as director of the GCPH a decade ago, in 2013 rather than 2023, the situation would have looked quite different. At that time, we would have been talking about a situation where health in general had been improving across the population as a whole and for almost all groups in the population. At that point, the challenge was for the most part about trying to ensure that the poorer in society would experience improvements at a rate which would be at least as rapid as the richer groups thereby closing the gap, the inequality gap in health across society. Now, that was a challenge enough because there was always the tendency for the better off to get healthier quicker than the poorer in society. So inequalities tended still to widen, though there were some success stories, and we'll see one of those in a moment. A success story, unfortunately, in the past. So just about that time, around a decade ago, that trend of general improvement across the population as a whole was starting to break down. People weren't aware of it yet. They didn't have the data yet. They hadn't got the research to understand that it was happening and what was causing it. But it was long before the pandemic and it was long before the cost of living crisis. That is, uh, not at all what one would expect or what should be happening in a wealthy society like the UK. And it's important to grasp how unprecedented it is and how shocking it is. It's what one would expect to have seen in a major pandemic or in a war. OK, so let's have a look at this. Just to take these figures, these are from, I keep wanting to walk over there because I've got a mic, but I've got to stay here, haven't I? Yeah, to be heard here. So let's have a graph here. So this, these lines will show 
changing mortality rates in the UK, in this case, looking at female all-age mortality rates standardized for England. These are slides from my colleague, David Walsh. So you can see that from the 1980s, and you can take that line away further back, right, for decades, you can see that the mortality rates are declining. And that means that life expectancy is improving. People are living longer, <coughs> healthier lives. That's for the population as a whole. And that the line goes up there until about 2012, 2013. There's what happens when you get to 2012, 2013. The improvement stops. We begin to flatline. There are some indications at points, maybe even of an upturn. Here's how it goes for um, the uh, least deprived 20% of areas. You can see that their mortality rates are lower, so they live longer. And for the poorer group, you can see that worrying figure. The line is going down, it flattens out, it increases, and the rates are higher. And you can see the inequality there between the least deprived and the most deprived. This is all before we get to COVID. This is the same graph for Scotland, okay? It was England a moment ago. Again, only taking us up to the pre-pandemic period. You can see that the mortality rate is just going back quickly. When I flick, you'll see that the, all the lines move up in the graph. Watch while I flick. They all go up. That's because health is worse in Scotland than it is in England, yeah? And you can see that the inequality, the difference between the red line at the top and the green line at the bottom, is widening across that period. Now, get ready for this one, for Scotland. This is premature mortality for females. So women who are dying before the age of 65. And you'll see the trend in Scotland as a whole, the blue line in the middle. It's going down until it gets to about 2014, 2015. Then it flattens out and begins to rise. But look at the bottom, the, the top 20%, the green line at the bottom. Yeah, it flat lines, but, you know, still kind of going down. But look at the poorest. Okay, that, that should stop you in your tracks. Okay, what that tells you. <clears throat> I can get quite upset here. So, Glasgow, the poorest 20% in Glasgow, you can see what's happening here from 2012. It's horrific. These are the figures for Edinburgh. These are the figures for males in Dundee. Now, so what happens? Um, 29 to 2011, Something happens here, which leads to the line flattening out and then beginning to increase. What is it? 2010, the start of UK government austerity, a program with the aim of cutting public spending by 85 billion pounds. The social security budget alone was to be cut by 47 billion pounds by 2020-21. So, this is shown by research to be the decisive factor in reversing those health trends and producing a new reality. Just to update the situation, um, to take account of COVID, this is that graph again looking at Glasgow. This is the situation up until COVID begins, 2019. What happens there? So what does that tell you? It tells you that all of this was unfolding prior to COVID, prior to the cost of living crisis, and COVID shows for premature mortality amongst women in Glasgow a continuation and worsening of, the, of an already established trend. The cost of living crisis, I have already said, will only be exacerbating this further. So we know what has been happening. And we, uh, has been happening, we know what's currently happening. Just to move on, um, and it's very bad indeed. We also know what needs to be done to address it. 
The evidence is abundant, it's clear, and it's robust. Health inequalities are the extensions of underlying social inequalities. We know it from many studies. Um, the fundamental causes of health inequalities are inequalities in income, wealth, and power. To address the former, one needs to address the latter in various ways and at different levels. One needs, as NSH, NHS Health Scotland said in 2013, I give you this source rather than an up-to-date source because we've known what needs to be done for a very long time. Uh, NHS Health Scotland clarified in 2013 that we need to address the highest level policies which impact on income and social security. We need to address the wider environmental influences on health like access to adequate housing and to unhealthy commodities, alcohol, tobacco, etc. And we need to mitigate the damaging impacts of wider inequalities through services and support to those worst affected. And that's the work that many of you will be involved in in different kinds of ways. But here's the hard part. We can produce research and we can shout louder and louder at government about what needs to happen. But government, particularly at Westminster, has not been listening. And it does not seem to be likely to listen sufficiently any time soon. In Scotland, helpful and important policies have been introduced, such as the recent Scottish Child uh, Payment to help poorer families, though the Scottish Trades Union Congress has made the case that current tax raising powers could, if used, resource significantly more. But many of the most relevant and potentially impactful powers around taxation, social security, and other key areas such as employment legislation are reserved to the UK Parliament. Now, facing this cost of living crisis following both a pandemic and more than a decade of health damaging and inequality generating austerity policies, it's important to remember that Scotland and the UK are in fact wealthy societies. But income, power and resources are ill divided, making society as a whole significantly less healthy than it should be and increasingly unequal in health too. So that's the context in which organisations like those represented here today and others at the front line are, I believe, battling to try to do what they can. Hopefully to make things better in absolute terms, and if not, at least to prevent some of the worst of the harm that's being done and which looks likely to be done. They are up against very powerful forces which are working to align the social determinants of health in adverse ways. And that seems to me to be quite a tragic situation. So I come back now to that poem at the start. If way to the better there be, it exacts a full look at the worse. Today I have present, been presenting to you in the spirit. Not because I want in some perverse way to celebrate or wallow in the worst or to get upset about it, but because, uh, and not because I want to send people home demoralized and feeling like giving up, quite the reverse. It's because I think that fully and honestly engaging with the realities we face is the essential basis for doing better in the future. Here I'd like to emphasize two aspects. Firstly, in the current work context, the work that many of you have been doing is even more vital. We need to mitigate the harm that's likely to be done on the existing trajectory over the next few years. But to do that in the current context is likely to require some new ways of doing things, some challenging conversations, newer kinds of collaborations, in large part to support and enable those at the sharp end or the deep end to make a difference in a context of diminishing resources. My hope is that it might be in that process of collaborating in new ways to deal with the most immediate problems that we can find a longer term way to the better. Because what seems to be increasingly understood and actually said is that existing policies and approaches have failed. That doesn't, I'm not saying the work that you guys have done has failed by any stretch of the imagination, but the work that's been done at a high policy level, and there's been a lot of it, to tackle poverty, to tackle health, to tackle the health inequalities, all of that work has effectively now failed. As the Associate Director for Scotland of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation said recently, we are now confronting 
and we've got the quotation here, the failure of government at all levels to reduce poverty in Scotland and the devastating toll this takes on individuals, including, of course, on their health. Now, I wholeheartedly believe that any way to the better that can be found requires that we all, and particularly policymakers, learn, actually learn, not just speak about learning, not doing performative listening, but actual listening, uh, that they need to listen from the, to the experiences and learn from the creative responses that we can see and will find in local communities. But it will also require more and a lot more than we have been seeing from government in terms of a willingness to tackle the underlying causes of health and health inequalities based on the knowledge and evidence we already have. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Shocking. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chick, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to discuss. I think we've got some questions. Um, I think that time-wise, I think we've got just under 10 minutes for people to have a wee look at these questions that Chick has kindly put together for us um, and just to have a discussion at your table. So we want to give you the opportunity to discuss, digest what you've just heard. Some quite shocking statistics there, quite frightening statistics. There's a big job. Again, the job, we know the size of the job. You know, we know the, we know the strategies. Um, again, it's left at our door, but we need people to be listening. Um, so if you can have a wee chat between yourselves around it, and then if you've got any burning questions, um, we will put them to check. And um, we've got about eight minutes to do this if people want to have a wee chat. Thank you. <laughs>